Okay, so we are now in our third section of discussing uh, produce, cleaning produce. As it's understood that it would be impossible to go through the entire line of the bounty that we have available to us. So we've chosen a different uh, combination, array of vegetables that are widely used and we have now in front of us five of those miscellaneous, widely used vegetables. We have our black broccoli, we have our cauliflower, portobello mushroom, scallions, your standard onion. Now, two of these vegetables, the broccoli and the cauliflower, are vegetables which are tightly packed. The florets are tight. However, even though the florets are tight, not tight enough for the insects not to be able to crawl in. Let's begin with broccoli. Broccoli, a floret such as this, a beautiful floret, came from a bunch of broccoli. It's about a three inch cut and this is about an inch and a half cut. We've removed it from the broccoli bunch and now we're ready to parboil it. We're ready to blanch it. We're ready to steam it. And perhaps at this point of time, you're even ready to crunch on it raw. So let's discuss a little bit about the challenge of broccoli and the solution on how to use this very valuable vegetable. We take a vegetable such as broccoli and the first thing we need to do is to identify what insects could be found in a bunch of broccoli. We have a broccoli head, fresh, beautiful. You're ready to cook it, put it on the plate and eat it. But it needs to be checked. And the reason why is because there are three types of insects that could be inside a broccoli floret. The three insects, which we're going to see them now, are sometimes buried in the very depth of the floret. Washing won't help. Soaking won't help. Any t putting it in ice water won't help. The only thing that's going to help is a visual inspection. To actually look at the floret, open up the floret, and examine all the different parts of the floret. How do you do that? You have to separate the floret pieces from the bunch. Okay, now we're ready to go to the next step. We have our broccoli florets cut into the proper sizes. We're gonna take our bowl, we're gonna place a couple of these florets right into the bowl. <clears throat> we're gonna go over to the microwave. We're gonna pop them in, not more than a minute and a half to two minutes. We remove it, let it cool for a moment or so. Now we're ready for the last step, the most cru crucial step. Let's take out the broccoli and let's begin our inspection. Our first place that we look at the broccoli is we look at the under part, the under part of the broccoli, to make sure that there's nothing on the stem of the under part. The insects at this point of time, the aphids, the thrips, are going to be now, instead of green and black, they're going to be brown. They've been discolored by the heat of the microwave or the heat of cooking them for two minutes. And then we're gonna open up, after we finish looking at the under part, we're gonna open up the depths of the floret in several areas. We're gonna open up in this area and we see it's clear. And of course, all of this is being done in the proper, well-illuminated area so you could see freely and we're gonna look 
And we're going to look, and then all of a sudden, we're going to discover possibly right over here a whole menagerie of insects. Wow. A perfectly good looking broccoli with at least one, two, three, four, five insects. We're going to take another look at another piece of broccoli. We're going to open it up in the different florets. At this point of time, it's pliable. That's what the microwaving, that's what the cooking did, made it pliable versus if you try to take a raw piece of broccoli that has been unprocessed, not put into the right microwave, not boiled at all, it's going to shed when you open it, it's going to crack because it's brittle. But now that it's soft, it's pliable, you could look at it, you could examine it, and after the proper examination and looking, remember you're looking for something which is obvious, it's going to look brown because of the contrast, it's going to be linear if it's a thrips, it's going to be round if it's an aphid, and we have a beautiful piece of broccoli over here, and we're going to Look at another piece over here, and we're going to see, oh, what do we see here? We see over here, we open this up, and we see a worm, a white worm, which started off green but became white due to the cooking. And that's what we're looking for. So once again, we're removing the broccoli from its stem. We're parboiling it, whether it's in a microwave, whether it's on the stove for about two minutes, making the broccoli pliable, flexible. We're then opening up the florets in all the different areas after we examine the very simple examination of the stem. Opening it up. We're looking, we're looking for one of three types of insects. We're looking either for the round aphid, we're looking for the thrips, or we're looking for the worm. Now, of course you have to realize that if it goes into your microwave and you do find it, it does not compromise the kosher status of your microwave. If you want a full explanation of why that doesn't, Please ask your local rabbi. But this is a process that you have to follow for broccoli. Now you ask, does that have to be done to every piece of broccoli? The answer is yes, it does. Because you could have one bunch of broccoli that is perfectly clean, healthy, and you could have another bunch of broccoli like this one that we have in front that came from a quality store, but this bunch happens to be infested with these worms, with these broccoli worms that are so visible to the eye that holding it, holding it at this length, an arm's length, with average eyesight, will spot those worms buried in the depth of the floret. A floret not visible, not able to be seen unless you open up the floret and you've discovered that worm. Now we're ready to go on to the similar vegetable cauliflower, also having a potential insect issue, not anywhere as prone to insects as broccoli is, but nevertheless a checking should be done. We remove the florets from the stem, take several florets, remove it, different parts of the cauliflower. We first begin by examining the underpart. Over here, the insect presence will be extremely noticeable. The cauliflower is white. 
the thrips that you're going to find are generally gray, generally black, could be brown, very discernible, able to be spotted just with the scan of the eye. And that's what we're doing when we look at the underpart. But then we just have to also just pry apart, and this could be done raw, this doesn't have to be done boiled, pry apart the different areas of, of the florette looking for the presence of insects. We take a cross sampling of the cauliflower. We don't have to take off the whole cauliflower. We take off four to six pieces of the average size of cauliflower. And we examine it by, again, looking at the under part, prying apart the cauliflower, florette looking inside. And then we could continue and use the cauliflower as desired. Another perhaps practical uh, recommendation, uh, if you want to take the cauliflower, place it into a bowl, place, take the bowl, fill it with water, cook it for about two minutes in the microwave, remove the cauliflower, look at the water. If there is insect presence in the cauliflower, they're going to appear in the water. That's another way that one could just ascertain and be ensured that their cauliflower is, is insect free. Let's go on to mushrooms. Generally mushrooms do not need any type of inspection that goes in regard to button mushrooms, shiitake, other mushrooms which are more complicated is a portobello mushroom as we have here Oyster mushrooms can be a problematic, but let's talk about the portobello mushroom, a very widely used mushroom, very important to anyone's kitchen. The insects, the fly actually, could be found in the fan, in the brown fan. What we do is we break off the stem of the mushroom, and then we just clean the fan could be done either with a knife, as we're doing now, just easily removing the brown without too much damage to the mushroom. You could take it off also with a spoon and scoop it out. Great job no brown. You just proceed by going to your sink, just washing it, washing the surface. You're going to wash it well anyway because a mushroom does tend to be a bit dirty. And then you're left with a perfectly clean mushroom ready for sauteing, ready for cooking, ready to be put in any salad. Now let's discuss the last two items, and that is scallions and onions. A scallion in the family of an onion. Over here, we have two types of insects. We have the insect, which could be generally found in the, in the bottom portion of the scallion, in the scallion bulb. The type of insect that we're looking for is a type of thrips, but they're baby thrips. They're translucent. They're very small, green thrips. The good news with scallions is it's extremely easy to clean and to wash. Being that the primary insect on a scallion is that baby thrips, 
is that translucent little green thrips, they have very little gripping power. They don't stick to the bulb, but they could also be on the inside. So what do you do? So we take the scallion over here, a very healthy, beautiful looking scallion, generally coming in six or seven to a bunch. We begin by removing the bottom, undesired part. Now, if you want to use the whole scallion as is, you begin just by simply slicing open the shoots vertically as such. Opening up the shoots could still remain attached to the bulb. Then we proceed to carefully with the slice of the knife to vertically continue the cut all the way to the bottom. So now you have a scallion that has been completely opened. The area where the thrips can be lodged can be in between these very thin layers comprising the scallion. Over here we have the solid part. So you have sometimes two to three to four layers of thin layers of the scallion. Now we have one more insect to deal with that's found in the green shoot, extremely visible. These leaf miners are tough to get out, but the Rabbeinu Shalayla made it very easy for us because they are extremely easy to identify. As I said before, when we spoke about basil and spinach, the indication of these leaf miners are these squiggly lines, these trails. You see a trail? You just either cut away the portion where the trail is in, or you could just remove that entire green shoot. So now we take the scallion that is now opened up vertically, has been exposed. We loosen those several layers of the bulb, and now we go to our faucet. Going from the bulb to the top, or vice versa, you begin washing the scallion. Opening it up, making sure the water is cascading downward, is covering the different layers of the scallion. It's not a pretty sight, but it's certainly a kosher way of eating your scallion. At this point of time, you've washed your scallion very thoroughly. The pieces, the layers are loosened. And this is a guarantee that you have now just taken care of your scallion. And now it's ready to be eaten. The next item, the last of the items, are onions. A couple of years ago, there was a discovery of thrips being part of an onion in the inner layers. A lot of research was done during that period of time. And the research concluded with the following discovery that a regular, hard, firm onion that's hard like a hard ball needs not to be looked at. You could just a regular cursory scan as you're just processing your onion, removing the layers that you normally remove, peeling it away and just looking to see if 
any problem on the onion. And the onion that is nice and firm, hard onion, at any signs of any problem, could just be cut up and used without any concern. The problem that, we, that was found, and this was the common denominator in all the onions that, have, that had presence of thrips, were certain telltale signs. They either were soft, the onion was soft, you're able to squeeze your finger into the onion, or the onion already had signs of rotting. With either of these two signs, that rotting has begun, or the onion has now become soft, that is, can be a, a sign, that can be an indication that inside those layers of onions can have thrips. So what should you do? Throw away the onion? That's, no, that's not what we're suggesting. Cut, uh, cut the onion. Of course, you're going to cut away the rotten portion. Take a look what we found, the rotten portion right over here. You're not going to use it anyway. Cut it away. Get rid of that rotten portion. And as we're going to use the rest of this onion, you're just going to be a little more careful. You're going to look at, as you cut, cut it up, you should look at some of the inner layers quickly to examine to see if the onion is clear, free and clear from any signs. Just go a little, one more layer. You see it's totally free and clear. Just put your onion together and slice normally. Have a look at asparagus, very popular item. Asparagus, interesting note, how did we discover that asparagus has an insect issue? Many years ago, goes back about 19 years ago in the OU, we got a call in the office. A consumer purchased giant asparagus, canned asparagus, and the consumer said that he emptied the content of the asparagus can right into his pot, and all of a sudden he saw an Olympic team swimming right in his kitchen. We immediately took that call seriously. We did a very in-depth research. We chose cans from all different areas of the country. We opened those cans, and lo and behold, those cans quite frequently showed up with those thrips. So we immediately, the OU, took off its certification from asparagus cans, and Giant no longer had the OU on its asparagus. Is there any way to eat asparagus? The answer is yes. If you don't mind a very closely shaven asparagus stem, then there's no problem. It works perfectly for an asparagus soup. Looks a little bit flimsy for a side dish. Let me just show you very simply how to clean the asparagus. The asparagus thrips actually, as we found out during our research, to figure out why didn't we see, why didn't the mashkiach going to the plant discover the asparagus? having thrips. The answer is because when the mashkiach picked up the asparagus stem, he saw a perfectly healthy looking stem. Little did we know that under these triangles is a very small ledge. It protrudes from the asparagus stem 
and the thrips as the asparagus crown the ground, the thrips migrate from the soil onto this little ledge and then all of a sudden the triangle grows over that ledge and the thrips stay there until it gets confronted with intense heat and then it will go out from its slumber right onto the stem. And that's why the only way that one could be assured that the thrips have been removed is by removing the triangles from the stem and removing the, breaking the top off and just shaving the side either by physically removing the triangles or by taking a vegetable peeler with a couple of strokes your asparagus is prepared. We now just concluded the third section of our presentation.